guess. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from that point of view. I just think sometimes people are in circumstances whereby, however sensitive you are, however well-meaning you are, maybe your circumstances don't allow you to uh, to act in the way that you'd like to. But, you know, the more information we get to people out there, the more information we get out about the fact that, you know, just testing may not be the be all and end all, even if you test HIV positive. Things have moved on over the years. We now have effective treatment to control HIV. Um, you know, we need people to understand that actually it's important that we just get on in society as like everybody else. Angelina Namiba and Dr. Alwyn Williams, thank you both very much indeed for being with us. And now the serial, the next in a series of dark stories in the Pan Horror series. It's by Edgar Allan Poe, known to be very scary and sometimes disturbing. And in this case, he rather excels himself in horribleness. His The Black Cat was chosen for Halloween, and it is particularly grisly. I have not been believed. I would be mad (laughs) to expect that. (laughs) The judges have declared me sane. So tomorrow I must die. I have been provoked beyond the endurance of any man by forces I can't comprehend. No one will believe you. I can't sleep, can't pray. Tonight, my punishment is to replay the events that have tortured, destroyed me, until dawn. I was known as a tender-hearted boy, delighting in animals of all kinds. With age, experience taught me that the selfless love of a brute runs far deeper than the light fidelity of man. I was married young to a woman who also loved animals and filled our home with them. John, look. We had birds, a monkey. He's on the curtain pole. An excellent dog. Oh, you tell him, Chester. And a cat. Not any cat. Pluto, remarkably large and beautiful. Your cat. Velvet black from nose to tail. (laughs) Follows you like a shadow, he does. Green eyes watching every move. I think Pluto is a witch cat. Louisa! (laughs) You're familiar. Of course, neither of us believed such superstition. But Pluto and I certainly had a close bond. But you were changed. Not by one hurt you could rail against, but a thousand slights. A distemper you could not fight. Filthy brute! Are you frightening him? In my study! It's private. You, 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 uh, educated and laughing. Uh, I'm going out. It's late. You're tired, John. Get your damn hands off me! I'm going out, I'm going out! Oh, I could see the hurt I caused. All right. Oh, good boy. And that hurt made me drink. And so the disease grew. You didn't contract it, John. Louisa! You chose it. And every night brought it home. Only Pluto escaped your temper, but even he, elderly and feeling the frailty of his body... You dare turn away from me! I I am master of this house, and... Stop! Stop! You drew blood! The fury of a demon, gin-stoked, burned through me. I grasped the cat by the throat, took my penknife and cut out one of its eyes. In the morning, I found Pluto. I slept like the dead. He allowed me to clean him. I woke with an aftertaste of disgust. Poor, poor cat. But it didn't touch my soul, and I readily drank it away. Pluto recovered. He could get around perfectly well and no longer suffered any pain. But the scars went deep. His one eye was ever watchful, and he fled at your voice. And that wounded me, for he loved me before. Yes. That wound induced vexation, and inevitably the spirit of perverseness. 
the urge to transgress the very laws that protect us from our worst natures. From the child stealing the apple, to the gambler who plays to lose, from the liar who portrays himself, to the murderer. I couldn't stand the sight of the wretched creature any longer. One cold, sober morning, I slipped a noose around its neck and hung it from a tree. I hung it with tears streaming. Hung it because it had loved me. Hung it to place my soul beyond the reach of even the most merciful and powerful God. You saw, didn't you? Too late. The body disappeared. Was it you? Cut it down. No. If it had been me, I'd have given him a decent burial. That John. night, John, wake up. Wake the up. curtains of my bed were in flames. With great difficulty, we made our escape. But some of our animals Chester. did not. In the morning, Louisa found, scorched into the wall above my bed, the shadow image of a gigantic cat. My entire worldly wealth had burned. We had no money to move or repair. We lived hand to mouth. Much of it spilled in portside saloons. I could not rid myself of the phantom of the cat, and into my spirit crept something almost approaching remorse. I walked an underworld, haunted not by my crime, but the loss of my companion. So I looked for another to take his place. <laughs> Drinking alone, half stupefied, I looked up and suddenly he was there. Not him, but a cat resembling him in every respect except one. An irregular splash of white on his breast. He followed you all the way from the port? Yes. But, John, you can't keep him. Not after. After what? He is a handsome animal. So like Pluto, even down to the one green eye. One? In the light of day, I could see what darkness had hidden. A chill ran through me. Won't be much of a mouse, sir, will you, cat? From that moment, the cat sickened me. And as my discomfort increased, the more the brute sought me out. We really should give him a name. If I sat, it jumped on my knee. How about Prince? If I walked, it got under my feet. It would grapple up to my shoulder, licking and purring. Oh, we should call him Burr. He sticks to you like one. I loathed that animal. Longed to strike it down. But past guilt restrained me. And truth be told... How about Puka? I was afraid. Imp? Not a physical evil, exactly, but... Or star, because of his white mark. That irregular shape. Although it's more like a question mark. Which by degrees... An angular question mark. Assumed a graphic form until... Oh. Oh my. It looks like... It can't be. The gallows. Instrument of justice. Suffering. Death. It horrified me, and the beast knew it. By night, I started hourly from nightmares to find its hot breath on my face, its weight bearing down. Suffocated by these torments, any feeble remnant of good within me died. Your hell was my hell, too. It was too much for any man. You were a monster. Enough. Cruel, violent. Enough. Even before that day. And is it any wonder? Can you not leave me in peace, even on my last night on Earth? My love, it's nearly dawn. Oh. 
Get off me! Get off me! It was fated. I'm not a cripple. Since the fire, we had been compelled to live partly in the cellar. And one night, the stairs were steep, it was dark. Try to kill me, send me to hell. I'll see you there. John, and the cat. No! I will not allow it! I lifted the axe. No! Swung at the cat. You! Her hand stayed me. I had buried the axe in her brain. She fell without a groan. My immediate concern was disposal. I considered cutting the corpse into pieces and burning them in the fire, or throwing it whole into the well. But I finally determined to wall it up in the cellar. The walls were loosely constructed, rough plastered after the fire, and next to the chimney, good. a hidden void. Very good. I took a crowbar and dislodged the bricks, wrestled the body in, then relayed the structure exactly as it stood. When I finished, the wall appeared undisturbed. In the summer heat, the plaster would cure quickly. Only then did I remember the beast and took up the axe. But a thorough search confirmed the animal had indeed fled. Oh, the blissful relief. For the first night in years, I enjoyed sound, tranquil sleep. Yes. Under the burden of murder, my dreams were light. When three days passed with no sign of the beast, my happiness was complete. Upon the fourth day... We must search the house in connection with the disappearance. If you do not cooperate... Of course, I am completely at your disposal. The police left no nook or corner unexplored. When they descended into the cellar, I quivered not a muscle. Confident in the concealment, my heart beat calm as an innocent. The police were satisfied, were about to depart. It might have ended there, but some glee, some taunting devilry took hold of me. Gentlemen, I'm delighted to have allayed your suspicions. A, a little more detective work will confirm my wife is alive and well and staying with her sister. I didn't know what I was saying. I, and, and this, this, this is a very well-constructed house, don't you think? Was I damning myself? Despite the fire, these walls are, are solid. Even as they stared. Stone solid. Some perverse, brazen hubris made me go further. <clears throat> I picked up a broom and struck the very wall that hid the corpse. Seems to preserve us. Break down the wall! The smell brought me to my knees. Dear God. The corpse stood erect before us, decayed, bloated, gore-clotted, skin pulled into a grin. Upon its head, with its solitary eye of green fire, sat the beast I had walled into the tomb. Feed! Liar! I didn't do it! I didn't do it! He drove me! He drove me to it with, with his, his witchcraft! It's dawn. Your last day. Any final words, John? Before you face the gallows? Forgive me. Believe me. You at least must believe me. Yes. I do. And don't say I didn't warn you. Now do join Jane tomorrow for a programme as part of the launch of BBC Sounds. She'll be talking to Jill Soloway, the creator of the drama series Transparent. That's tomorrow, usual time, just after 10 o'clock for today. Bye-bye. Woman's Hour was presented by Jenny Murray and produced by Laura Northedge. 
And tomorrow, Woman's Hour is broadcasting a special programme to launch the new app BBC Sounds. All